Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode six of the True Blue Crime podcast. As always, I will be your host, Dan, and if you would like to receive more updates in regards to upcoming episodes or when an episode is going to launch, please like and follow the Facebook page at True Blue Crime Productions. Check out the website at www.truebluecrimeproductions.com. And as always, if you can support the podcast via our Patreon site under True Blue Crime Productions, I definitely appreciate that. My plan is to continue to create free episodes so that everyone can enjoy listening to some true crime. And any support on Patreon will allow me to do so. Also, if you do support me on Patreon, you will get a shout out in a future episode and a personalized thank you message from the host uh, via Patreon. So enough with the business. We'll go into episode six, in which in this case, I will be covering the Lululemon murder. Before I get into the actual crime itself, I'm assuming most people by now know uh, what Lululemon is, but just in case you don't, uh, Lululemon is a athletic wear company, mainly known for its yoga attire. Uh, it's a company that was founded in 1998 in Vancouver, British Columbia, and the first store opened in November of 2000. The company has grown to the point that it has 574 stores across the globe. An interesting tidbit as I was doing my research for this case, it is named Lululemon because the founder wanted to make the name of the company as westernized as possible as he was targeting uh, Japanese customers. And he apparently knew that L is a hard letter for Japanese uh, speakers to say in the English language. So he found it funny how difficult it was for them to say Lululemon or what it sounded like when they did try. Um, this guy's the, the founder is not going to be a, a great guy. He eventually was asked to step down because of further comments he made about the name and, and Japanese language. And then in, I want to say it was 2014, he was asked to step down uh, as chairman because of derogatory comments he made when people asked why they didn't make more plus-sized women yoga attire. And uh, there was a lot of Remarks that he made that were pretty derogatory towards uh, plus size women. So the company itself continues to be rather popular. However, I did note in my research that while they had $8 billion in sales in 2022, but they posted a net loss of over a billion. And I'm not a great business mind, but just seeing those numbers um, make me believe that the company might not be around that much longer if, if they're going to post a billion dollars in, in net losses. But anyway, getting into the crime itself, the date of the crime is actually going to be March 11th, 2011. So we're talking about roughly 12 years ago at the time of this podcast. The location of the crime is going to be the Lululemon store located in Bethesda, Maryland, which is just outside of Washington, D.C. The victim in this case is going to be Jaina Troxel Murray, who's 30 years old, and I struggled with how to present this case. I've seen or I've heard this case done in more of a narrative form where all the information is presented to you in kind of a story form, and then you kind of make your own determination and then they twist the story at the end. I'm going to attempt to continue what I did last episode, which is provide information as it was made available during the investigation. I think at least my personal experience is listening to true crime podcasts. I like to think about the case as it's being presented and not exact be told all of the information in the beginning. So with that being said, there's going to be a second victim in this case that police are going to discover identified as Brittany Norwood and she's age 29 years old. 
So timeline of events, uh, we said that the crime occurred on March 11th. However, it's not going to be until March 12th of 2011 that a manager for the Lululemon store, identifies Rachel Ortley, arrives. I believe this was about 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning. She finds the front door unlocked, which is obviously strange. And as she goes through the front door, she sees that the, it looks like the store has been ransacked. As she's processing this information, she hears a faint moaning coming from the back of the store. So she exits the store and she's actually calling 911 when she re realizes that there's a man standing outside of the Apple store, which is right next to Lululemon. They share a wall. And from what I had read or heard, the this is at the time period in which the iPad 2 was being launched. So there was... If you can recall back in the day, whenever a new iPad, iPhone, and I guess it's somewhat still to this day, but it was a big deal back then when the iPad 2 was coming out. So they would have, often have lines outside of Apple stores for people waiting to get their hands on, on the next generation of whether it be iPhone or iPad. And I heard somewhere that the... The, this guy had waited the day before and they had sold out of inventory, but they thought they were maybe going to get some more. But anyway, this guy who's outside, his name is Ryan Ha. He's he's standing there waiting uh, in line for the Apple store to open. So Rachel sees him and tells him what's going on. She says the front door's unlocked. It looks like the store's destroyed and there's I can hear moaning in the back. So he agrees to go in and check what's going on in the store and as he goes through the store, he's noticing bloody shoe prints on the ground. And when he gets to the back, he works his way towards the office. And there's kind of a stock room and office connection in the back. At some point, he sees a partially open door. And you can see through the crack in the door that there's a body laying. And it's blocking him from being able to open the door. But it's laying face down in a pool of blood. And the, the body's not moving. That's... And that's not where the moaning is coming from. He then hears the moaning again and realizes it's actually coming from the restrooms that are located between the showroom floor and the back area of the of the store. And he opens up one of the restrooms and in there he finds Brittany Norwood. She's zip tied at her wrists and ankles and has blood on her face and what appears to be cuts on her body. At which point he tell, tells Rachel to call 911. So I don't know if the first time she called 911 she hung up on them because she saw Ryan outside and thought instead of getting the police all involved in case it isn't a big deal or ended up being something she wasn't didn't need the police for, I guess. She was just going to have Ryan do the walkthrough and if everything was... Or she could handle whatever was going on, she didn't need the police. But at this point she does contact the police and they arrive shortly after. It's gonna be a uh, officer Christian Newth shows up first. He uh, enters the store, sees the same thing that Ryan did. There's a body behind this door. Can't open the door just uh, to get to the body, but he does respond and check on Norwood who's in, uh, still in the bathroom he recalls that when he touched her she twitched in such a way that he was sure that whatever she had seen or gone through was extremely traumatic they're able to free her from her uh, bindings call for an ambulance and get her on her way to the hospital in the meantime a corporal Rankin arrives on the scene and now with the two of them they're able to push this door open where, where they've seen this this body laying face down they check for a pulse they find none they see that the person who's later identified as, as Jaina has received extensive injuries to her her face and head area and she's cold and uh, stiff to the touch around Jaina's body is a uh, an array of tools and items that likely were associated with the assault. The officers see a rope 
And I read somewhere that it, they said there was a ligature around her neck, and then I read somewhere else that said that there was just a rope there, but there were ligature marks around her neck. There was a hammer, a wrench, and various other items laying around uh, Jaina's head, kind of laying in the pool of blood with her. So before I go any further, I want to kind of touch base on who Jaina is. I think it helps before you get too far into the investigation to kind of paint a picture of who this person was. And I think it also humanizes them to a certain degree as we discuss uh, everything that happened to this, this poor woman. So as I said, her name is Jaina Murray. She's born November 22nd, 1980 in Kansas. When I say she was a driven individual, I think I'll let her educational accolades speak for that. I didn't find a whole lot about her childhood growing up or specifics about her, her family life or anything along those lines, but it was reported she had a bachelor's of degree in science from George Washington University, and she was about to complete a double master's degree from Johns Hopkins in communications and business. So she had aspirations to go far in life, and she really was working at Lululemon because of the business experience. Apparently she believed she was going to have opportunities to attend some conferences and whatnot that would be potentially networking opportunities for herself, and then I was going to get paid, and she's going to get a, a nice discount on, on a very popular brand of clothing. So... Her family described her as fearless. She loved doing adrenaline activities such as bungee jumping, but she was also someone who wanted others to feel comfortable and happy. I read a lot of statements given by her family, either at the time of her death or later on during the trial that's gonna be coming up where she, basically she was said to have had a infectious smile and a amazing spirit. So that was that was Jaina, and now we'll focus on the investigation. So investigators arriving at this scene now have three things to focus on. So they have the deceased victim, Jaina. They have the surviving victim, Brittany Norwood. And they have the crime scene itself. So each of these parts of the investigation are going to tell the investigators a story. So we'll start with this, with Jaina's story. It's very clear from the condition of Jaina's body, the items found around Jaina, that she experienced a, a extremely brutal attack that had lasted for some time. When her autopsy was done, I found different numbers for this, but it, it kind of came down to they're all relatively close to each other, but it was 331 total wounds sustained to her body, and somewhere around 107 of these were defensive wounds. So defensive wounds, since I haven't talked about them in my podcast before, most of you probably know, but they're wounds that are made while the body or by, while the person is defending themselves from an attack from another. So our natural instinct is to protect our vital organs and our, our face and our head. And as a result, we will sacrifice things like our hands, arms, even our legs to try to protect those vital organs because we can, we can live with injuries with a stab to the arm or the hand or, some, or, or something along those lines, but a stab to the heart is fatal. So we are programmed to fight back and, and use our hands and arms to defend ourselves and so she's going to sustain at least 107 of these defensive wounds indicating she not only fought back she fought back for a while and fought back through a lot of injuries these wounds all over her body the 331 of them are going to range in the size from punctures the size of a, of a ballpoint pen to larger lacerations and bruises all the way up to a skull fracture and a fractured spinal cord. Now again I saw some conflicting reports about this but it did appear that Jane at one time was strangled by a rope as marks one article I read stated that marks were found around her neck which were commonly referred to as ligature marks 
and that rope fibers are found in her fingernails, which would indicate that at some point somebody tried to strangle her with a rope and she dug in between her skin and into the rope to try to relieve the pressure so that she could breathe. Now her ultimate cause of death is not going to be asphyxiation via strangulation, so I don't believe that her attacker was successful in killing her with the rope, but definitely applied enough pressure to the point that she felt she needed to rip that rope away and, and the rope left ligature marks on her neck. The blood evidence is going to suggest that she tried to escape the attack. I read somewhere where they found her blood right up to the, I guess there's a rear door of this building, and there was blood, some of her blood was on the push bar on, on the rear door, indicating she tried to make an escape at some point. But ultimately, all of her blood from this attack is going to be found near the rear of the store, and nothing during this initial investigation, none of her DNA is going to be found outside of the store. Her pants have been cut open, indicating that she had been sexually assaulted. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the what they actually believe was the killing blow was that she had been hit so hard in the head with a metal shelving bar. And again, this is a clothing retail shop, so there's going to be a lot of metal bars that hold up clothing that, and they're most of them are, are significantly heavy or would make a formidable weapon if one chose and I believe this is what they determined was going to be the final killing strike was going to be a, a strike to the back of the head neck area with this metal bar. I also read though that they said that she was killed by a stab wound to the back of her neck that separated her spinal cord and went into her brain so I read it both ways that she was that there was this final blow from this metal bar or there was this final fatal stab and it, it may just be a matter of semantics how somebody's describing the action in terms of hitting somebody so hard with a metal bar I guess it could be seen as, as a puncturing style wound or it could be seen as as a fatal blow uh, strike so I think that both places that I read this were trying to describe the same thing. They're just describing it differently, but again, I, I wasn't there to see the actual autopsy or the weapons used or anything like that, so I'm just making assumptions here. Uh, the other thing to note, they did find strange in the initial investigation was Jaina's car was not in the parking lot or out in front of the store. It was actually found about three parking lots away. So basically, this is a large strip mall, and there's restaurants and other retail outlets and whatnot in the area and this is a uh, her car has found three basically commercial areas away down the road so that's what they're getting from Jaina so they know that she was viciously attacked that her car was moved at some point and that she apparently did not leave the store during this attack at all so Brittany, since she survived, is going to be able to tell police what happened. So she's going to state that on the previous evening, her and Jaina were working together and closed the store. Shortly after closing the store, Brittany states that she left her wallet inside the store and got a hold of Jaina to tell her, I need to get back in the store. I left my wallet there. Jaina agrees to come back to the store to let Brittany in. Brittany does not have keys, obviously, to get into the store herself. Jane is a manager and, and Brittany's uh, a regular employee. And at which point, after the door is unlocked, two masked men come out of nowhere and attack the women, push them into the store, and now they're going to be part of a robbery slash sexual, sexual assault at the hands of these two men. She described these men as uh, where, being dressed all in black and having black ski masks and Brittany states that the men uh, sexually assaulted Jaina but Jaina fought back and as a result the men killed her and that Brittany did not fight back and as a, as a result the men simply restrained her and then left her there as after after they committed the crime. So 
not that there's any conflicting reports based on what they're seeing from Jaina or what Brittany is initially telling them. Everything that Brittany says lines up with what they're seeing in the in the store and with Jaina. But as they look at the crime scene, things are going to start to come into question. So the crime scene itself, as I said before, the scene is mostly contained within the store. And this includes, there's going to be bloody shoe marks found in Jaina's blood throughout the showroom area of the store. These are going to be done in a size 14 shoe, which neither Brittany or Jaina are very large women and so for a men's size 14 shoe to leave bloody shoe prints indicated that at least one of the attackers would have been a rather large male. However, these shoe prints are not going to leave the store. There's going to be no bloody footprints found outside of the, the rear or front entrance of the store and eventually the bloody shoes are actually going to be located inside a little storage area inside the store indicating that whoever wore them would have put them on just to walk around inside the bloody store and then taken them off and, and hid them in the store. And it would later come out that these are shoes that actually belong to the store and are used for some type of, I can't remember if it was, it was like a mannequin type thing or for people to try them on in order to see how they fit the leggings fit with these shoes on but ultimately it was determined these shoes originated in the store so now investigators are going to have to think that a suspect came into the store put these shoes on walked around in the blood and then took the shoes off before leaving the store so they're also going to notice that all of the tools that were used to assault both Brittany and Gina are going to have originated in the store. So the store had a small toolbox, which is where the hammer and the wrench and, and all those items came from. The box cutters belonged to the store and the, as we mentioned before, the heavy metal shelving bar came from the store itself. So nothing, it, it doesn't appear that the suspects would have brought anything with them to commit this robbery. And even the knives that were used to cut both Brittany and Jaina would have been box cutters, as that's what would have been used to you know, open inventory and, and items and that kind of stuff in the store. So none of the wounds appeared to have been delivered by any large fixed blade knife or anything that somebody would normally attribute to a, a fatal stabbing uh, situation. And finally, the zip ties that were used to bind Brittany also originated in the store. So at this point, the investigators are faced with the facts that no single item of evidence originated outside of the store. But regardless, they do have a surviving victim with injuries that states that she was sexually assaulted. And as we talked about in the, the Jamie Kloss case, investigators have to keep all theories and all possibilities open until they can be proven otherwise especially in cases of sexual assault it's much less damaging in almost all cases to believe a sexual assault victim and then later prove that what they said wasn't true than it, than it ever is to dismiss a sexual assault victim claims and then later found out find out that the sexual assault victim was telling the truth so so this is all happening on Saturday morning this is when the store found open by Rachel and Brittany and Jane are found inside the store so the next few days are going to be filled with investigations based off what the crime scene and Brittany has told them and as I said before the, the investigators are going to believe what Brittany has told them happened and so they're going to follow up on some of that stuff, in, including grabbing surveillance video from nearby stores. This is a heavily commercial uh, retail style area with restaurants and stores, and there's an Apple store next door. There's other stores all, all through the strip mall, and a lot of them have external security cameras. So investigators look at external security cameras 
from nearby stores, Lululemon didn't have any security cameras either in the store or outside of the, you know, facing outside the store. So they're relying on other stores that potentially have this surveillance. And a couple things are going to come to light as a result of this. First is that they are going to see two men dressed in all black walking through the area around the time of the attack. So these men are going to become the focus of the investigation as this is exactly who Brittany said attacked, sexually assaulted, and murdered Jaina and attacked and sexually assaulted her. So detectives are going to set up surveillance to see if these guys come back. And sure enough, a few days later, I believe it was on that following Tuesday, I want to say around that time, police see these two, the same two guys from the security video walking through the area dressed in all black. So they are stopped, detained, and questioned. And it turns out that they are employees of a nearby restaurant that walk home after their shift. They're dressed in all black because that was the attire for the restaurant that they worked at. And they got off work around the same time this attack occurred on the night that it occurred. So I'm assuming they had some further way to clear these individuals that they were not involved but eventually police determined that they had nothing to do with the actual crime itself now the second thing they're going to do as all investigations do talk they're going to talk to employees in nearby stores and get surveillance video from nearby stores and in this case uh, this included the apple store next door i talked about how uh, the ryan one of the witnesses was waiting for the iPad 2 outside the Apple store. So the night before, which is the night of the assault, they talked to the manager and the employee who are working that night. Both of them admit to hearing the sounds of a fight or at least a very loud discussion going on next door. Now they sh- like share a wall with the Lululemon and they can actually be seen on security video walking over to this shared wall in the back area which is where Jaina was found and when asked by police they admit that they heard a panicked woman's voice in there saying talk to me don't do this what's going on and then that was followed by about 20 minutes of screams yelps and yells and then eventually a voice that said something to the effect of God help me please God help me but it sounded weaker than than it was before Now, these Apple employees would eventually testify during the trial, but they were rather harshly criticized by the community and Kayla's family afterwards for their lack of action. Now, when asked why they didn't call the police after hearing this, the manager stated he felt it was just drama next door. There was also a security guard that was working inside the Apple store at the time, but the video shows him just sitting at an iPad listening to music on headphones during the time that the other two employees are listening to the the scuffle that's going on next door. And it's unknown, it it said Apple security guard, but a a lot of the times retail places will hire a external security guard from a from a security company when they have things like large value item launches such as the iPad 2 or a new iPhone just to deter you know smash and grabs or or somebody coming in and and potentially robbing the place or or whatever it may be so I couldn't find if this was a guy employed by Apple and he was a full-time security guard there I mean it was a pretty it sounds like a pretty kind of a rich area of town uh, I can't confirm that, but with an Apple store next to a Lululemon, I can't imagine it was going to be in a real rough part of town where there's a high crime rate. So to me, it would seem strange that this Apple store would have full-time security guard working there. But I just theorized that because the iPad 2 was launching that they might have hired extra security just to keep uh, things under control. And that guy happened to be working there, did not work for Apple. These employees probably didn't know him all that well, and he's basically just there to make sure nothing happens inside the Apple store. Now, that doesn't excuse him from not taking any action if he was notified as to what's going on, and it doesn't excuse him from 
not really doing his job by sitting there listening to music when somebody's being murdered next door and he doesn't doesn't even realize it's going on so we'll talk about this more later on it's uh at, at the end of the episode but this this was just one of the one of the parts where it helped police in terms of it verified that some type of altercation occurred at the time in which Brittany is saying that they are being attacked by these two masked men but at the same time it's it's revealing that maybe some something could have been done to prevent what ended up happening if they had just contacted police so as we talked about earlier there's a little bit of a timeline going on here we covered saturday morning the assaults discovered and i have here it was 8 a.m not 9 a.m uh, mon then monday morning they the police are now going to be following up with norwood at her home asking her more questions he, i'm guessing to see if she remembers anything further at the same time i'm guessing that they started to realize that the stuff at the crime scene isn't matching up with her stories and so they want to get either lock her into her story a little bit more or get some more information to determine what's going on. Tuesday, the suspects are ruled out. Uh, that's the two guys they saw on the surveillance video and then they stopped and talked to. And this is when the crime lab is gonna start returning some of the evidence from the, cr the crime scene investigation on Saturday. Uh, I should mention that Kayla's car has been found by this time and it's that three parking lots kind of away and in that car they're gonna find Brittany Norwood's DNA so now and and they're gonna find Brittany Norwood's DNA on the zip ties that were on her which a lot of people would say well that's to be expected she was the one that was zip tied but they're gonna find DNA on the part of the zip tie that someone would use to tighten the zip ties and that is going to and no other DNA so that's gonna lead police to believe sh that the evidence points to her tightening her own zip ties likely with her mouth in order to look like she she had been bound so come Wednesday police are starting to fo turn the focus of the investigation on to Brittany Norwood and they ask her to come down to the police station and they want to collect fingerprints and DNA from her for elimination and now at surface value this is not abnormal uh, when I worked crime scenes I would often ask homeowners for elimination fingerprints and DNA because the majority of evidence I'm going to find in a home whether it be after a burglary or home invasion robbery or anything along those lines is going to be the people that live there the majority of the time the homeowners so I'm gonna if I find a fingerprint on uh, on a mirror I want to make sure that before I submit that into the crime lab to see does this match anyone I want to provide the crime lab with somebody that it could match to and it wouldn't be a suspect in this case the homeowner so Asking Brittany to come down to provide fingerprints and DNA is not out of the norm of any investigations, but it is going to alarm her, especially as she knows now that Kayla's car has been found. So on that Thursday, her family calls the police and says that Brittany wants to talk. Brittany tells the police that she has more information and she, that she was afraid to tell the police earlier because she was afraid the attackers would come after her. She tells the police that during the assault, the attackers made her go out to Kayla's car alone and move the vehicle and then come back. And that she did this because the attackers saw her ID and mentioned her home address and said that if she didn't move the car and come back, that they would eventually come after her and kill her. So she did as they said, and that's when she came back, and that's when they bound her up and left her in the bathroom. Brittany even said during this time period when she moved the car, uh, she was sitting over in the parking lot that she moved the car to for approximately 90 minutes and during that time period a squad car came through on a patrol, saw the car sitting there and I believe this was verified later by one of the one of the police officers that said they did in fact see somebody sitting in this car 
in this parking lot, but it wasn't, they, they weren't doing anything illegal and didn't look too suspicious. So they didn't stop out and check on this car, but they just remember, you know, as part of their patrol, seeing this vehicle. And that was Brittany in Kayla's car in the middle of this, this ordeal. So Brittany could have flagged down the police officer and said, hey, the Lululemon was robbed. You know, they at this point, I don't, I don't know if they would have, in her story, if this was before or after, Gina was killed, but she could have notified the police in such a way that they could have arrested the individuals and put them in jail so they couldn't come after her and, and put an end to this whole ordeal. But she chose not to flag down the police officer and then walked back to the Lululemon store alone and left Kayla's car there. So it's no surprise to investigators, those closest to the case, that by Friday, police are announcing that Brittany is being, has been arrested and is being charged for the murder, the assault and murder on Jaina. And keep in mind, the department likely would have been under a lot of pressure from business owners and just uh, citizens alike. As I said, this is not a real high crime area. And I saw, I read one report, one of the restaurants said that for the week after, until Brittany was arrested, they had about a 50% drop in uh, people showing up to the restaurant just because they were afraid to come to the area. Because at that time, everybody still believed this was a randomly targeted attack on the Lululemon store and that if they go to this area, you know, who's going to be next? These guys haven't been caught yet, um, all that stuff. And that, that gets into whenever I see police officials talking on the news, uh, I know the, the, the most recent case was the, the murders of the four college students in uh, Moscow, Idaho, and the, the, the police get on there and say, you know, there's, we don't believe there's a danger to the public. It's a double-edged sword when, when police have to come out and say something because for, on one hand, they don't want to come out and say, hey, this guy is still at large and any of you could be next. They don't, they don't want to incite a, a, a panic, but at the same time, usually that verbiage is reserved for when it's a murder-suicide and the, you know, suspect is dead or... You know, they know who the suspect is, he's in custody, whatever it may be. Uh, that's typically the time to use the, you know, we don't believe anybody else is in danger line, not when the suspect who committed this atrocious crime for no known reason and left four college kids dead and is hasn't even been identified yet, let alone arrested, you know, telling people, that, the general public, that, you know they don't believe anybody else is in danger i think eventually is a disservice because people either stop believing them when they say that when it is true i just yeah again a sidebar but just something where when these situations occur there is reasonable danger felt amongst the the public and police are under a certain amount of pressure to alleviate that feeling of danger by making an arrest or making some type of a public statement. Uh, and in this case, again, within less than a week, given the difficult circumstances of this case, they're able to make an arrest, come out to the public, and, and at that point they can say there is, is no danger to anybody else. So. So that being said, I get, it's it's pretty clear based on the investigation that the police went from viewing Brittany Norwood as a victim, as we did in the beginning, to a suspect. And, and again, this is where I'm going to try my best when I write these episodes out to navigate them in a way that I'm not telling you guys in the beginning that the suspect is Brittany. I, I, I tried my best to explain it as I went along without giving it up too much although in this case it's kind of tough because her actions were so not difficult to figure out that she was involved but I just don't want to come out in the very beginning and say the 
deceased victim is this person and the arrested suspect is this person and then when I get into the story everybody says well wait a second wasn't that one of the you're talking about this person as a victim but you said they were the arrested suspect so anyway as I move on I'm going to continue to try to do that at least instill a little bit of mystery or allow people to try to figure out these cases themselves I'm not going to go out of my way to trick anybody uh, but I'm also trying not to spoil it early on is I guess what I'm trying to say so in this case, we've now arrived at the conclusion, based on the investigation, that Brittany Norwood is going to be the suspect in Jaina's murder. So let's get a little bit into Brittany Norwood, and, and that'll help kind of explain what happened here in this case. So Brittany Norwood's born in 1982. I couldn't find a whole lot about her childhood. I know she's part of a large family, and they instilled kind of a hardworking attitude in, in their children. and that paid off for uh, Brittany in, in the form of she was a very gifted athlete. Uh, she She's so gifted, so good at soccer, she earns a scholarship to play soccer at Stony Brook University and has dreams of playing for the U.S. women's national soccer team. She did play at Stony Brook University from 2000 to 2003, but started having issues with everyone around her. And this is teammates, classmates, and roommates all started her accusing her of stealing items and many believe that she had kleptomania. Uh, kleptomania, for those of you who don't know, is the basically a condition in which somebody feels a de intense desire to steal, and whether that be from businesses or loved ones or whatnot, and, and they can only achieve a certain level of relief by committing the act of, of stealing an item. So. Many believe that this is what was going on with Brittany, but for whatever the reason, uh, she steals from enough people and there's enough evidence of it that eventually they approach officials at the university and she's expelled from the school and she loses her scholarship. So she moves out to Washington DC area to live with her sister and gets a job at a hotel. She's She does well there, she gets assigned to working in the VI with the VIP guests and again this is Washington DC so we're talking a lot of politics a lot of money coming through um, so she's doing well but she still has this pull this desire to do something with athletics so she decides she wants to become a personal trainer she applies at a, a lot of fitness studios but it doesn't sound like she's gonna she has the experience that she needs to get hired yet so for a variety of reasons, I guess Lululemon was a good fit for her. I can only imagine, A, she's getting a discount on the clothing that is very popular at gyms at the time, and B, she's going to be able to make some connections with people that come in to buy this clothing in terms of you know, personal trainer jobs or fitness studio jobs or something along those lines. So she gets the job at Lululemon, and they're was a lot of stuff in the research normally I probably wouldn't bring up speculatory stuff but in this case there was evidence found I don't know if it was at the time of the assault or the time of the arrest that she was answering Craigslist ads for high-end prostitutes so again with that VIP job with hotels and you're talking politics and I'm thinking shows like House of Cards a scandal all these other types of shows it, seem like that was kind of her, going to be her lifestyle or that was her lifestyle uh, that's what she desired to have was this kind of a high-end uh, lifestyle and, and I don't know if that's going to motivate her towards what's going to happen next but uh, basically the night that Jaina was killed uh, it was just Brittany and Jaina closing the store that night and Jaina had been notified by a lot of other co-workers of hers that they all believed that Brittany was stealing. And, and Brittany hadn't worked there that long, so she was gaining a pretty negative reputation very quickly in regards to the fact that they believed that she was stealing. And so Jaina made it a goal to catch Brittany. And that night, uh, during what they call bag checks, if you haven't worked in, in retail, most major retailers are going to require their employees to do bag checks, which means every employee, whether they're manager or not, needs to have their their bags checked before they leave the store to make sure they aren't committing some form of employee theft and removing items from the store that haven't been paid for. 
So it's during one of these this, this bag check at the end of the night that Gina sees a pair of $40 leggings in Brittany's, uh, one of Brittany's bags. She confronts Brittany about this. Brittany concocts some story about how she paid for the items earlier with an employee that was work that wasn't working anymore had left earlier in the evening believe that Gina tried to confirm this and wasn't either wasn't able to or, or knew that this was a lie and it's very clear from the story that the police weren't called and every company has different policies in regards to when police are contacted for employee thefts i happen to work part of my patrol area was a was a high end retail outlet mall and every store had different policies. Some wouldn't call the police at all for employee theft. Some would only call if it was over a certain amount, and others would call every time somebody stole a you know five dollar item. So it just depends on on the company and the policies and whatnot. I don't know what Lululemon's policy was at this time at this location in regards to employee theft, but. Since the police weren't called, I can only imagine they must have had some other form of discipline, likely just you know termination without charges uh, that was going to happen, but just wasn't going to happen that night. And ultimately, Jaina and Brittany go their separate ways. Now, Jaina does contact a co-worker of hers, informing them that she had caught Brittany stealing but it wasn't long after this that Jaina gets a call from Brittany stating that she wanted or that she had accidentally left her wallet in the store and she needed to get let back in. At this point, I found in the research that basically Brittany and Jaina were not friends at all and didn't really know each other. Jaina's family would say that Jaina would talk about a lot of her coworkers and hanging out with her coworkers, going to movies with them, going out for drinks with them, whatever it may be outside of work and talk about their stories at work, but that Brittany's name was never brought up to the family. So they believe that just because Brittany hadn't been working there that long, and maybe Jaina knew that she wasn't gonna be working there much longer, she didn't make any attempt to have a relationship. So to the point that when Brittany needed to be let back in, she didn't even have Jaina's number in her phone. She had to call a coworker of hers that had the number uh, you know, mutual coworker of the two of them that had Jaina's number so that Brittany could get a hold of Jaina. So Jaina agrees to return to the store with uh, or and meet Brittany there to let her in to get her wallet. It's at this point that the confrontation begins, and the only person truly, uh, the only person left alive to to tell the story of what actually happened is is Brittany, and I don't think any of us can take what she says to be accurate what is most likely happened was there is it was one of two things either Brittany called Jaina back there to try to beg Jaina not to pursue anything with the with the stolen leggings and when that didn't work out Brittany got angry and went after Jaina or Brittany put it in her mind that she needed to silence Jaina before anybody else found out about these leggings. And, and Brittany wouldn't have known that Jaina had already told another employee that she had been caught. So maybe, you know, there's, there's a chance she thought that she could avoid any trouble whatsoever if she, if she took Jaina out. But regardless of what the intention Brittany had in getting Jaina back there, uh, back to the store. Ultimately, we know what happens. There's some form of a confrontation. Jaina is attacked, assaulted, and killed. And then Brittany performs an elaborate cover-up, albeit a failed one, to try to deflect any blame away from her. Based on the coroner's findings and the audio witnesses at Apple, it is believed that this assault went on for approximately 20 minutes so this is not a situation in which somebody pulls out a gun or a knife and within a matter of a few seconds has ended somebody else's life what Jaina endured for roughly 20 minutes would have been some of the most 
painful and terrifying events of, of someone's life. Uh, she likely would have known that there was a good chance she was going to die. And just the psychological terror along with the physical pain, it would have been an excruciating uh, way to go. So basically after killing Gina, Brittany goes through her cover-up and then she goes and binds herself in the restroom. And since this is all happening, I want to say it was around 10 o'clock at night, she she does move the car. There's 90 minutes there. The assault itself, somewhere in the realm of 20 to 30 minutes. So that's two hours of time. So for the other roughly eight hours of time, other than when she's covering up or trying to cover up the crime she's staying in that bathroom self-bound knowing that Jaina's dead body is in the same building so it kind of lets you know where that mindset is at and that's it's another thing that people questioned as soon as the as the story came out is Brittany wasn't locked in that room by any means and the way that she was bound with the zip ties, it would not have been impossible for somebody to make their way out of the store and try to get help for Jaina or for herself in the situation that she was in after the attackers left. So it was just another one of those ill thought of parts of the plan that she just literally sat or laid there for eight hours waiting for somebody to come in the morning to get her when she in if the situation had been real she likely would have tried to at some point get herself out of that situation it also did come up the question of why she even moved the car and it seems to be something that created a whole nother side of the story that ultimately kind of tore down Brittany's uh, false story and there was some speculation that Jaina might have just parked along the curb, which would have been kind of a fire lane violation situation because she was, remember, she was only supposed to go unlock the door, basically walk Brittany back to get her wallet and walk back out. So it's not like she needed to legally park in one of the spots further out from the, you know, from the store. And this is 10 o'clock at night. The stores are closed for the most part. So there's not going to be a lot of traffic, so somebody parking at the fire lane for you know four or five minutes isn't a big deal if, if that's all that it was, was getting her wallet. So as Brittany now has to worry, is somebody going to, you know, a, a police officer going to stumble across this car in the fire lane while she's trying to cover up this crime? If, if you know, what, what makes sense, maybe she thought it would make more sense the attackers would take Jaina's vehicle and move it somewhere to get away, but didn't realize she was going to leave her DNA in the car in the process. And I know I mentioned early on that she had, you know, a bloody face and, and visible wounds that looked like she had been sexually assaulted, but no proof of sexual assault was found on, on either of them. It was determined later that all of her cuts, including the, the wound to her face, were superficial. And I do also have to say that anybody that assaults somebody for 20 minutes and has that other person has defensive wounds, there's it's a high likelihood that they're going to get injured during that assault too. It's pretty well known if, if you've ever been in a fight that nobody short of movie stars or action stars in movies leaves a fight without a scratch on them. Even if you win a fight, you're likely going to get some injuries in some way. So superficial injuries on Brittany could easily be explained by attempts by Jaina to get Brittany off of her or it, it, when people use weapons like box cutters or uh, tools to strike somebody else there's a not to get too gross here but there's a lot of blood involved and weapons slip so it's easy to cut oneself while uh, inflicting injuries to somebody else so just because Brittany had injuries to herself police believe these occurred either a combination of her doing them to herself to make it look like she had been assaulted the same way as Jaina but also likely occurred during the assault on Jaina so all right to wrap all this up with the trial the trial is going to begin October that year 
and this is going to be one of those cases where the defense is not is not going to go in and argue that the wasn't me wasn't their defense. There's enough evidence to show that Brittany was there and that she was the only other person that could have caused harm to Jaina. So what's going to happen is Brittany's going to be charged with first degree premeditated murder. And the defense attorneys are going to attack the charge, not the the crime or the culpability of of the suspect in this case. So they're going to go after and say, yes, Brittany killed Jaina, but she didn't mean to. They're going to say that she went there to try to work out the issue with the stolen leggings, and there was a fight, and that basically in a, in the heat of passion, Brittany killed Jaina not meaning to. It was a mutual fight, and she just came out as the victor, and then her half-hearted attempt to cover it up and look like she did nothing was proof that she didn't premeditate the murder. This is a very similar to the defense used in, say, like the Casey Anthony trial, where the prosecutors went after Casey Anthony for first-degree murder. And this is another case we'll probably cover at some point, but it wasn't so much that the jury didn't believe that Casey Anthony didn't have a hand in killing her daughter. It was more or less the prosecution failed to prove that Casey Anthony premeditated the murder and it's there's a huge difference from a sentencing standpoint of where a judge can sentence somebody under uh, first second and, and other degrees of murder so a lot of the times the defense attorney is not trying to get their client acquitted of all charges now in the case of the, uh, or in the Casey Anthony trial I don't know if there was every state is different if there was some type of a situation because a lot of the times juries can decide themselves we don't see this as a first degree tri murder trial we see it as a second degree so we don't find them guilty of first degree we find them guilty of, of a lesser charge but i don't know if there's some states that don't allow that that the jury is only selecting from the charges put forth by the prosecution and an overreach like in the case of casey anthony results in the jury having to find somebody not guilty just based on the charge itself so again it, it seems kind of what they were either trying to do here now oftentimes it's not a again i said it's not a acquittal situation it's a they're trying to get their client found guilty on a lesser charge and i think what this case came down to was not necessarily whether and what Brittany had in her mind when she called Jaina to come back. I think what the jury ultimately decided would have been the premeditated part of it is the length of time that this assault went on. You know, 20 minutes, I guess, if you think about over the course of a day doesn't sound like a long time, but 20 minutes of assaulting somebody, 20 minutes of making nonstop decisions, and, and that's where I said the, the heat of passion part of a murder is usually a split second decision it's the partner finding their spouse in bed with another and that person happens to have a gun and shoots and kills you know both of the people in the bed that part partner likely didn't think in in their head that they were going to walk into this bedroom and find this but when they did and they happened to have a weapon nearby they make the split second decision based on emotion to kill both parties. They can be found guilty of a lesser charge of murder because they didn't have the time to think about their actions. They just reacted on emotion. Whereas in this case, that argument doesn't hold as much weight because Brittany is making decision after decision after decision to find new weapons to attack Jaina with to find new ways to try to silence her, to try to kill her. And, and we're talking on the course of 20 minutes, not a split second, but 20 minutes worth of decisions. And I think that's why after only 21 minutes, the jury came back and, and found Brittany Norwood guilty of first degree premeditated murder. The judge sentenced her to life in prison without the possibility of parole, finding that she was 
somebody that should never be walking the streets again. So that's where Brittany Norwood is now. She's incarcerated for life in in Maryland. Now, again, I each episode I try to pull out a hero of the story, and some would say that Jane is a hero, which I, I agree. I'm not arguing against that. Um, unfortunately, you know, sometimes heroes don't survive, and that's that's the case here with Jaina. But I'd like to do something a little different here and point out the anti-hero in the story. And there's there's really two of them. One of them clearly being Brittany Norwood, but the other one is going to be just as a collective the the mindset of the Apple Store employees. I know I said I would get to this later because um, I didn't want it to kind of to sidestep that long from the from the case itself but we're seeing this more and more in society where people aren't stepping up to do the right thing we're seeing somebody in a medical emergency that needs help and it's not just somebody doesn't provide cpr they might not know it they might not be comfortable doing it whatever it may be but instead of even calling 911 they're taking out their phones to record it because they want to catch this moment they want to put it on YouTube or Facebook Live it or whatever it may be and this this is just another example of it where the Apple Store employees had the opportunity to call in a situation and just have it checked out and if it ended up being just drama it ended up being just drama but if it was enough to draw your attention to the point that you came over and just based on the words that were being said and the the change in the demeanor of the voice it's very clear that somebody needed help and you just chose not to help them. And in fact, the, the same judge that admonished Brittany Norwood for what she did, did take a second during the trial to call out the behavior of the Apple Store employees. And I believe they used the term uh, callous indifference in regards to their actions because everybody now knows had those employees call the police when this when they first heard the noise as long as the police would have gotten there within 20 minutes which most of us can assume they would have Jaina would still be alive today so I'm not going to stand on a giant soapbox and scream out that everybody needs to do their civic duty and be a good Samaritan every chance they get but every once in a while when we have an opportunity with hindsight to look back at a case like this and see how things could have been different, I think it's a it's a learning opportunity for all of us to discuss and and think about how we could do things differently as a society. So anyway, enough with that. That is the case of the Lululemon murder. And want to thank everybody for listening and uh, staying tuned into all of my podcasts again as I mentioned in the beginning if you like and follow my Facebook page at True Blue Crime Productions uh, you'll see upcoming episodes you'll see when I'm launching a new episode I hope to be able to do some more social media stuff once I get some more episodes out there for people to listen to I hope to have the website up and running at some point here and hopefully by the time people are listening to this it is and finally, if you have a chance, please swing by and support me on Patreon so I can keep uh, doing these, these episodes. So appreciate it, everyone. I hope you guys have a great day. I'll talk to you later. Bye.